Buenos dias, Paul. Thank you for joining us today at Business Spotlight Series. Today, I'm excited to introduce Paul Blake, owner of Newcastle Eagles, the all-time most successful British team with 27 titles. Paul, welcome. Buenos dias, Xavier. <laughs> Very nice accent, by the way. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. That's nice to hear. <laughs> yeah. Great. So, Paul, tell us, how, how do you end up doing what you do? Um, long, long story, relatively short. I, um, not long out, out of university, um, had a couple of jobs leading up to this one, but I was, I was headhunted to a role of, um, marketing manager at Newcastle United Sporting Club in the late nineties, 97. Um, and that was a, a dream project for Sir John Hall, who, who owned Newcastle United at the time, uh, and wanted to expand the uh, expand the portfolio. Um, so he brought a rugby team, a basketball team, and an ice hockey team: Newcastle Falcons, Newcastle Eagles, and Newcastle Cobras. Ice hockey, um, and uh, uh, maybe marketing manager. Um, there, there, there was a chap that had been marketing manager the year before, and uh, it didn't work out for him. Uh, and they were looking for um, somebody to. Effectively, um, as it was explained to me at the time, sell a new concept because neither the rugby or the basketball or the ice hockey had a footprint in Newcastle that was uh, generating an audience of any of any size. So um, all three were new sports, essentially, to the city from a, a pro point of view. Um, yeah, so I started in August 97. Wow. Wow. Um... Is this something you 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 wanted to do when you were a child or 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 not? Yeah, that's a really good question. So yeah, the 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 answer to that is yes. So I moved up to Newcastle because of sport. Um, I did a sport management degree at uh, what is now Northumbria University. Latterly, did a, a marketing master's degree there as well. Um, but I was always interested in sport. I played football. I played basketball. Um, you know, as a kid, you, you had the dream of playing for Man United, um, for anyone professionally, really, as a, as a footballer. Um, and uh, but also, I was always, I was always, I look back at it now, very, you know, very clearly, quite intoxicated by the look of a sports arena that, that's full, whether it's football or rugby or basketball or tennis or, or, or any sport, really, cricket. <laughs> Um, and, uh, I, I grew up in Bristol and the, uh, you know, just a, a short little story here. We were driving in and out of the town center on a weekend and the M32, uh, used to run right over the top of Bristol Rovers football ground. So you could actually peer down from the car yes. if a match was on, you could see the match, the match being played. And I always remember as a kid seeing the crowd and I'm just thinking that that's a beautiful thing. You know, um, and that's always stuck with me. So, so I kind of always had that in the back of my head. That number one, I'd like, I'd like to be a pro sportsman. But if I can't be that, I want to work in sports, and I like stadiums. You yeah. know, I just yeah. that whole thing is is big for me. So, so that's really where it comes from. Even though the opportunity to do the job was um, uh, was offered to me, ultimately, I was right place, right time. Uh, yes, and, and snatch their hands off, essentially. Yeah, that's brilliant. Uh, thanks for sharing that. Tell me, Paul, what's uh, who is the first person that comes to mind when you think about success? <laughs> who inspired you? That's a very good question. Um, so I mean, there's sports athletes that inspire you, and we all have. You know, if you're interested in sport, we all have that. So for me, it would be the likes of a Michael Jordan or whoever. But that's yes, that's fairly cliched. Um, I suppose in university days, I did my work placement while on the sports studies course at Nike, uh, because the uh, the UK offices were based in Washington, just outside of Newcastle. Um, uh, long story short there as well, Brendan Foster had brought that franchise to the UK at the point that Nike was really still quite small mm. in its infancy. 
So, you know, I look back at what Brendan's done over his, his career and he's, you know, he's one of a list of people that I've had an interaction with across my, uh, my career that I would say are really inspiring people. You know, the Great North Run is, is Brendan's big, big pro lifetime project, you know, biggest yeah. half marathon in the world. Um, but he's done many other things. Um, my, my boss, who was then my business partner, Ken Nottage, uh, massive inspiration. Again, somebody in UK sport that I could see how they would paved their destiny in sport and yeah. wanted to follow that. Uh, oh, goodness me. I mean, the you, list would go on. You, sorry, your boss, you, you told me before, he, he, he became your, your business partner and mentor. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, yeah. It was it was always my mentor. Um, so Ken, just a, a little bit about Ken. He uh, was a, a pro basketball player in the UK. Played for England um, dozens of times. Uh, became chief exec at Newcastle United Sporting Club. Um, and it was Ken and I that were given the job of. Uh, um, selling the three clubs at the point that the football club had decided to pull out, which was three years after I started at the, uh, at the sporting club. Um, Ken then went on to become chief exec of Gloucester rugby club for 12 or 13 years. Um, went through a stadium development with, with Gloucester, you know, that's a club with, you know, habitually 15,000 fans a game, um, week in, week out. Um, and um, was just well connected, um, very wise man, a gentleman. Uh, you know, went about his business the right way, the way you know I would hope to. I'm a diff very different character to to Ken, uh, um, but but I try to be that way as much as I can. You know, so that I mean, that's no better way of. Uh, um, explain in a role model of somebody that, that that's inspired you, you know, somebody that you want to try and replicate the best habits of, I think. Yeah. Um, so tell, uh, what kind of values, core values do you, do you, do you get from, from him or, or, or attributes you thought, you know, I want to be like, I want to, to be like that. Very organized. Mm. Uh, I mean, this is all boring stuff. Sound financial controls. I'm very a marketing guy, so, yeah. yeah, I'm a marketing guy, so that's that's historically the bottom of my list. Yes. So I'm a marketing guy that that took over a club and became a an MD overnight. Um, without those skills, I've had to you know, I've had to buy into them, and, and you know, they've almost become a, a an obsession and addiction in a, in a way. But um, if I hadn't, the, the, we would have failed. In the first yeah. two years, yeah. Uh, so, so those those you know, strong business skills could lead a board. Uh, always had wise words and analogies and yes. uh, examples of precedent um, matters that had happened that led him to a decision that he was taking at that point to guide everybody else through that decision. Um, never lost his temper, uh, but was had a way of getting his point across. Um, I'm not so good at that, <laughs> but I try. I try. Yes. Yeah. So all of those things, really, just a real model. Um, as he would say himself, actually, a real model corporate leader. Um, I'm less of that. I'm just, I'm, I would say I'm a bit more of you. I didn't know this at the time, but I'm, I'm a bit more of a risk taking entrepreneur than a corporate leader. Yes. Yes. You mentioned two things, you know, most businesses have two major problems. One is marketing and the other one is the accounts, the numbers. 
Um, you, you focus a little on marketing in your life. So, you know, you, you tick that box and you mentioned, you know, what you learned from, from, from your, your ex uh, business partner, financial control. So you put those to the forefront. It's a, that's a good, uh, good place to be. Yeah. And, uh, and, and if you run a sports team or teams, um, it's pretty easy to lose money. Yes. Pretty easy. It's not. It's not the business that you would choose to, uh, um, you know, pave your destiny financially. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, it's a. It's a. Uh, it's probably doing it down, but it is a lifestyle business. Yeah. In the sense that it's a passion, and uh, I'm working on my hobby. Twenty-seven years in. Yes. So you you've managed to 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 make it a, a profitable business, uh, yeah. and um, what uh, what are some of the challenges you 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 had to face to build the business to where you are today? So so there were many because ultimately in in taking the business over it wasn't a startup it was a failed business. So in the previous three years it had lost one point seven million. Um, and the final year, it traded at three hundred eighty thousand loss, I think. So um, now, uh, to to Sir John's, you know, unbelievable credit, even even now, twenty five years later, he he didn't want any of the three teams to fold. He wanted them to to survive, uh, and, and in giving us the challenge of of uh, selling the three teams, he he wiped the debts. So, so they were all debt free, um, but were were failing in their trading position ultimately. So, even though they were debt free, it didn't mean that the next twelve year, twelve month cycle was yeah. going to be a positive one. You know, and we with the basketball club, an example of that was we were in year two. We were just coming out of year two of a four year arena hire deal. Obviously, the arena was where we were playing the games, and that. And that contract was way too expensive for what we could manage moving into this new new ownership phase. Um, and they wouldn't renegotiate. What they did say is, get yourself out of the last two years of this agreement, and then we'll renegotiate. But they wouldn't renegotiate on the, uh, ex the existing four-year contract, which obviously they'd signed with Newcastle United, not with Paul Blake, with no pockets. Yeah. Um, so so that made it hard that 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 made it really difficult in in the uh, the first two years um and uh and consequently we we did lose money in those first two years couldn't afford to lose money had no had no um investment no reserves no no nothing so money lost was money lost and we had to find a way uh to either repay that those debts in the first two years or fold. Um, so it was it was uh, yeah it was tough times. I was twenty eight, um, pretty naive, um, having to learn quickly if I wanted it to survive. So how do you get out of the hole? A um, couple of things. We were in those first two years, even though we'd lost the money, we lost. We were just short of two hundred thousand in losses those first two years. So, in terms of where we taking it to from where it was, that was an improvement. But we didn't have the, that, the, you know, that sort of money. So, and and it was more in year one than year two. So it was still, you know, it was still moving in that direction. Um, I uh, needed some help around me. My wife left her job and said, come on, let's just work on this together. Uh, so she came into the business um, uh, in year three. Uh, and we've worked together ever since. So that's 24 odd years working together. Not, uh, everybody, not, every, not everybody can work with, uh, you know, the, uh, with their spouse, if you like. Yeah, exactly. So that's, so that's a, a miracle in itself, but, but yeah. it works well. Yes. Um, surely harder for her for her than for me <laughs> um, knowing me uh, I'm the risk taker 
Sam is risk averse, which is good, uh, good mix. Uh, so to answer your question, how do we how do we repay? So this is a this is a good a good business story. Um, this wouldn't happen now because obviously we, times have changed, technology's changed. Uh, I've told this story many times, so I'm not. I don't, I don't have a problem telling it. The majority of that debt ended up with the government, ended up with the HMRC, because they weren't great in those days at chasing debt. They are now. Yes, very much so. Yeah. Yeah, um, and uh, it was really, it was really a case of find a way to pay it, or, or, or we're going to have to pack our bags, you know. Uh, and I met a guy working for a, a, a small um, accountancy firm that were, were funded by some government grants at the time, a company called Entrust in Newcastle, who was an expert in renegotiating uh, tax debt with, with the government. And he negotiated for me a 10 year repayment of that debt. Which, you know, it would never happen now. Just, you know, it's a right place, right time in a lot of respects. Um, and I managed to repay that, that whole debt over 10 years whilst cycling the business out of loss into enough profit to pay the, uh, the long-term debt. Um, so, yeah, so we, you know, and that, I suppose in a way that's an indication of how much, uh, we, we wanted the business to succeed, uh, you know, it's not for me to say, but obviously lots of businesses fail in their in their early years, and we quite easily could have walked away and been one of one of those statistics. Um, we chose not to, so it was a mini fail, but in the grand scheme of things, it wasn't a fail um, in the way that you you know you constantly hear um, business leaders saying you need to fail to a few times to succeed where well, we had a, a micro fail in there that we didn't yeah. allow uh to impede the longer term success yes. that makes sense. brilliant so what are some of the things you did to 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 turn a loss making business into a profit making business okay so i suppose the first the first caveat is it's never significantly profit making because in in our world uh the more you, the more income you generate, the more you end up spending on your team. Uh, and I've, I've often you know, used this analogy this morning. It's a bit like playing the um, computer game Gran Turismo. You start off with a beaten up mini car and engines rubbish and all of that. You win a race, you get the prize money from the race and you buy a new engine and then you buy a Porsche and then you, you, you know, you just, that's the way we work. The more income we generate, yes, the more goes back into. But again, moving from losing money to yeah. breaking even or making a bit of money is yeah. it's a, it's a big thing. It's, it's still a journey, and that's why that's why we're raising the turnover on a yearly basis. So, um, so I suppose the first point is we uh, and and what comes into that as well is cash flow. A management of cash flow. So even though we might be slightly profitable, that doesn't mean we've got enough cash yeah. to get through what what is a very seasonal uh, yeah. trend in terms of cash flow. Um, so we, I just had to get smarter with the financial controls. Mm. See, see problems coming three months out as opposed to three days. Um, you know, just I mean, that's obvious stuff, really, isn't it? But uh, but but trying to do that in practice when you're running a an event heavy deadline business is is is, is difficult. We've not many staff, but we managed to do it. You know, we just managed to get ourselves into a position that uh, we we'd you know manage the debt, manage to negotiate ourselves a small overdraft, which again for a sports team is extremely difficult. Banks don't want to give any pro sports teams any kind of uh, lending uh, facility, but we managed to negotiate a, a small thirty thousand or so overdraft for a, period, a long period. We were sat on the back end of that for a very long time. Uh, probably should have found a different way to do it. Um, uh, and and you know if we hit if we hit hurdles. 
we would find a way to get a loan. Yeah. Um, we had lots of smaller loans across that, that sort of 10 year period to get us to a level of sustainability. Yeah. So I suppose long, long story short, um, the, the headline figures, the year before I took it over, it's not a big business by the way, but the year I took it over, the, the team had spent a million and brought in a quarter of a million. Fast forward 25 years, the, t- the, t- the turnover this year for the club will be about 1.5 million. The turnover for the foundation, 2.5 million. So collectively, you know, we split the business to club and foundation, which I can explain in a minute, uh, mid 2000s for a couple of different reasons. So, so ultimately, we're, we're not far shy of a four, four million or so turnover business now at break even with a small stadium as an asset. Um, from those, you know, from that, that broken business, essentially. Yes. Uh, and, and we think we can take it, well, very much dependent on the on the successful failure of the league because a lot of pro, well, all pro sports in this country de- derive their largest income from the league, not from their own activities. Uh, Premier League being the best example. So TV income and Premier League um, right sales are, are are upwards of 75% of any club's income in the Premier League. The clubs are generating 25% locally or less. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. And that's um, that's not unusual. That that the same applies in rugby at a lower level. Doesn't apply for us because we're not generating those league uh, funds just yet, but we hope to moving forward. Yes. That's another, that's another topic. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, Paul, by the way, I've got a burning question to ask. Yeah. What's your height? Uh, I'm 6'5". Okay. Does that help you to get loans, your height, when you want or, or to renegotiate debt? Does that help you, your height, you know? <laughs> no, because it was always on the phone. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you, you may want to have in, in, in-person meetings, you know, in post, yeah. uh, you know. I, I I'm sure it's helped at times over the years. Yeah, uh, yeah I mean I, I I'm pretty confident these days. I wasn't always that way. Um, coming out of at university and coming out of university, I was much less confident. So, but going through this journey, yeah, you, you, you have to find a way to be one yeah. way or another. So definitely. definitely. What would you say then uh, to somebody who wants to to start a business? Um, yeah, w- w- what advice would you give to somebody who wants to start a business? Take the plunge and uh, go for it. You have to be stubborn, I would say, resilient. Uh, you you need to have you need to have a laser focus, I would say. You know, and be really clear on what your uh, what you're trying to achieve because it's very very easy to we all do this prioritize on the things that interest you uh, and drop to the bottom of that list things that are absolutely necessary to do that day that you then don't do because it just doesn't interest you and you're not mentally um, uh, ready to do those things on that given day because the weather's not very good or whatever it may be so you have so i suppose that means discipline yeah you have to be disciplined you 100 have to be organized uh i my my email admin now compared to what it was like 20 years ago actually emails have probably only been around just about that length of time yeah. so uh it is way better now than it was. Um, and, I, and I'm in a business where we, we don't have a big enough staff base. So I still receive for the, for the, for the role and my, and my colleagues the same way too many emails on a daily basis for what we do. Um, uh, but I'm in a process where, you know, I don't lose emails for the most part. I have a system. And I think that's incredibly important. Uh, having been someone that didn't have that, and looking back at that now, 
possibly if I'd had it in the early days, maybe we could have got to where we got to quicker. Um, so I think organization is super, super important. And as and finally, as a marketing guy who, you know, drank the Kool-Aid of the marketing theory in a master's degree, the most important thing is sales. Not marketing, sales. Yeah. You can't sell, your business is in trouble. Yeah. And that's coming from a marketing guy. Yeah, I mean, I think the difference between sales and marketing in my head is marketing generates inquiries, sales converts them into paying clients. 100%. 100%. But the funny thing was, and I was I was talking to a group of students this morning, um, and I was telling them about the, and this is going back 20 years, so it may, it may have changed now, but the marketing uh, master's degree I did, in that year, there was one single unit on sales. It was like half a unit. It was maybe three weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, such a small percentage of that of that larger theory course. Yeah. Um, no doubt an MBA would, would reflect that as well. You know, it, it's just, it's almost, it's almost like a dirty word. Hmm. You know, I'm, I'm talking to students this morning about selling and they're all looking the other way. Apart <laughs> yeah. from the American students in the room who are exactly the opposite. Yeah, interesting. So, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's, not, it's not something, you know, so if, you, if you are skilled in sales and, and, and even more to the point, the servicing of those sales and, the, uh, and you're organized, that's gold dust. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, the, the, the three legs of a business simplifying is sales and marketing, delivering your client, and then financial, making money in that, you know, those three legs, really. So, uh, yeah, cost yeah. control, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Well, Paul, it's been, uh, it's been great. What, finally, what, what will you, do you have any advice for your 18-year-old self? Wow. Uh, I think the advice would be, you're not always going to be, you're not always going to lack confidence. That will change. Uh, I, and, and put yourself in positions uh, that will get you that confidence. And that, that's, you know, that's me talking to people that aren't confident at 18. There are a lot of confident people at 18 years of age, but I had to do things like, I became a lecturer at, at, at the university uh, while I was doing the master's degree, not because I wanted to do that, but I knew I needed to get in front of large numbers of people and talk because I, I, I just couldn't do it. I hated it. Uh, my, my first job away from there, which was the job before going to Newcastle United Sporting Club, I worked for a, a sports video analysis company, which was groundbreaking at the time that wasn't so much of the, the issue. I was having to sell that product one-to-one -one with my heroes. So I had a, I went to Watford football club one night and tried to sell it to Graham Taylor, who was, who just stepped down as the England manager. Um, David Lloyd, who was the England cricket uh, coach at the time. Uh, I, I successfully sold this system to him and ended up working with him for three months on the ashes in, 1997 wow. so that that was that was groundbreaking for me because it's one thing teaching yourself to sell one to one me and you but i'm in front of guys that i've watched playing football on tv as a kid and trying to sell them something graham soonis was another one wow uh so so put yourself answer your question put yourself in positions that are uncomfortable that you know will help uh, your business journey moving forward that's a brilliant, brilliant share. Thank you so much for that, Paul. Um, I think it's been a great uh, interview. Um, and thank you for uh, um, well being part of joining us today at Business Spotlight and uh, sharing with us your experience, uh, wisdom, and, and candor with us today. Thank you so much. Gracias, Javier. <laughs>